We've been talking about destiny, how to discover God's will for your life. Um, I think it's been helpful. Has it been helpful to people? Yeah. Yeah. Liberating? And tonight, we wrap it all up. And what I'm going to talk to you about tonight might seem really basic, but it just, it's everything. And then once we've got that, I'm going to do a little bit of application, apply it in a couple of different places. But here's the the big question for tonight. What is your life calling? What were you placed here on this earth to do? Some of you might just feel like you're just fumbling along. Like, wow, what am I meant to do with this life that I have? What's going to take all of your idiosyncrasies, all of your special little talents and foibles and just bring them all together and, and, and cause them to make sense? What is your life calling? How do you discover your life calling? That's tonight's big question. How do you discover your life calling? Do you know, if you really want to know the answer to this, there's there's someone who's really keen to to help you with this. It's Google. Um, I asked Google this week, um, how do you discover your life calling? And they really helpfully pointed me in the direction of a whole bunch of websites that would tell me how to determine what is my life calling, what am I here for. And over and over again, I saw this recurrent theme um, that you can discover your calling by asking yourself a bunch of questions. What makes me happy? What makes me happy now? What makes me happy when I was a kid? What did I enjoy most as a little kid? (laughs) Got some words about Smurfs. That's for another time. What are my unique gifts? What great thing can I do? What am I most passionate about? What moves me to the depth of my core? What legacy would I like to leave? What do I want people to say at my funeral? It's all about digging down to the core of who you are and what motivates you, what makes you special. And what satisfies you? Discovering your calling is about finding yourself. And then when you've found yourself, living true to yourself. And there's some wisdom in all of that. But there's also something profoundly dangerous. Because this approach forgets that there might be something or someone more significant than my own motivations calling me. Let's pray. Father God, you have gifted us all with life. And we dare not waste it. And you've brought us all here to this moment to look at your word and for me to help us as we look through it. Please give me strength, give me wisdom, give me your words. Move us all by your goodness and your love that we might discover our life calling and be set free to live the way you call us to live. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So clearly, God has called all his children to something far greater than just our favorite hobbies, than collecting Smurfs or whatever it is that you did as a kid or whatever it is that really drives you. Your, your specific calling, it's a tricky one. And it may take you a long time, it may take you a lifetime to figure out that thing that just brings everything all in together and, and makes it all make sense. But the mission that God gives you, what God has called you to, your life calling from God is crystal clear. And it's exciting. And this is a really big one. But I I did a little exercise this week looking through the Bible for, for these big mission statement type passages. You should do this. This is what your life should amount to. How to sum up how to live life. And the more I looked, the more I found So what I want to do just quickly is just to walk you through a few of them. 
just to get our heads around what it is that God has called every believer to do. Matthew 6, verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's a nice, simple little statement. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You want to know what to do with your life? Jesus, just before he ascended into heaven, he said to his disciples, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. This is Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That is a great calling, is it not? That is a call to action. That is a call to a meaningful life. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. There's your life right there. Present it to God as a living sacrifice because of his mercies. Romans 14, 7 and 8. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. That's a gutsy call to arms, right? If we live, we're going to live for Jesus. If we die, we're going to die for Jesus. But whatever we do, it's going to be for Jesus. That's a good call. How about this? Philippians 1. This is Paul talking to the Philippian church and saying, This is what's on my heart for you people. For it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless. For the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That sounds pretty good too, right? There's a good call for your life. To know more and more about God and be filled with the love of God and approve what is excellent and then do it and be fruitful in righteousness because of Jesus and all to the glory of God. Colossians 2 verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. You're seeing a bit of a pattern here? Because of what God has done for you, go and live for God, and he will give you the power to do that, and he will fill you up with thanksgiving and fruitfulness and knowledge and understanding of who he is. This is a great life calling. But think about this. Compared to those questions at the start, what makes me happy? What do I want to do with my life? This is God saying, this is what I have done with your life. And now instead of putting yourself at the center, make me the center and everything will have meaning. Go with me to Colossians chapter 1. I want to unpack this one a bit more. Again, this is Paul praying for the church, for the Colossian church. He said, I'm so thankful to God because you have been saved and you've understood that Jesus Christ died for your sins and set you free and now you have this hope laid up for you in heaven. And I can see that what you believe is being played out in your life and I'm rejoicing at it and it's motivated me to pray and to pray and to pray. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. This is verse 9, page 983 in the Pew Bible, Colossians 1 verse 9. We've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Here's your life's call. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, and bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen? Amen. Imagine that. Imagine you living every single day from here on out in a manner worthy of the Lord, every single step fully pleasing to him. 
and bearing fruit in every good work. And as you're doing this, increasing in the knowledge of God and what he's already done for you and what he is doing for you and what he will do for you, that is a great life to live, is it not? Yes, it is. Get this. He goes on to explain how you enter this life and how God will strengthen you in this life. Verse 11, may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. This life, this great life calling we've been called to, he is going to give us the strength to do that. Is that good? Is that empowering? Giving thanks to the Father because he has done something incredible for you, Christian. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered you from the domain of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. How is that? How is that? This morning, I was standing here at the end of each service. Well, once there and once there, but I was up the front. And people came forward as a response because we read that Jesus said, narrow is the gate that leads to life. And few choose to enter it. And you need to choose and make that decision. And people came forward. And just seeing people, it... I just welled up with tears, Timon, because these people are saved from a pointless, purposeless life into a life of worth and value. They have a life calling now, and they are going to glorify God with their lives because He is going to help them endure and I'll weep at how beautiful that is. Here is your life calling to know and understand Jesus, to walk in a manner worthy of him, to please him, to bear fruit in every good work, and to know him even more, knowing that he will do it. I reckon you said this this morning, and I've stolen it, that we were created to orbit around God. And thanks to what Jesus has done for us, we can actually do it. It's a magnificent calling. The Westminster Confession says man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And in response to what Jesus has done for us, we're called to live for him. Get to know him better and let the world know him better and be fruitful in service to him. This is your life calling. Have you got it? Yes. If you're following Jesus, this is your life calling and it's wonderful and you can do it. It's part one. Now I want to take that. You've got that right. You know what to do with your life now. Let's apply that into two places. I'm going to talk about your work, your career, how you spend your days, and then talking about marriage. Because they're the two biggies, right? We've been leading up to this the whole, the whole series. Knowing your life calling, how do you apply that to work? With work, what is it that you were built to do? And you ask this question, is there one perfect job that you've been set apart for? Is there a career that is ideally matched for you? Is there a job that uses your unique abilities and interests and experiences and one that will be the best place for you to serve God? Maybe. But figuring out what it is and actually getting to that position is a whole other thing. You might ace it, you might not, but here is something really liberating to know. Flip the page. Colossians 3, verse 23. It's the top of page 985. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, any work, any work you do is sacred. 
And this is liberating. It means that there's not one magical career that you've got to hold your breath for or hope that this is it. And if I don't get it, then I'm missing out. Anything you do, if you do it as to the Lord, honors God and is part of his life calling for you. Whatever you do just busts it wide open. So what do you do with that? Well, wisdom says you need to choose a job, a career, something that you can work at heartily as for the Lord. And that means steering clear of of anything immoral or soul-destroying. As an example, if you struggle with your job at a, a service station or a news agent or a DVD store or something like that that sells pornographic material, well, that's a good sign that you're struggling. Maybe you need to step away from a job if you can't heartily sell those magazines as to the Lord, whatever it is. If you're in a job or, or you're studying for a career, that is going to get you to a point where you're just so consumed and fixated on the money or the prestige or the position and you lose sight of your life calling to live for Christ, then you probably need to get honest with God about that. Because your life calling is so much greater than any career you do. That any career you do, you can fulfill God's call on your life if you're faithful. If you're in a job that's tearing you away from the responsibilities that you have to your family or to your neighbors or to your church just because it's overloading you with time and pressure, then you might need to leave it because there is a greater calling to give honor to Jesus. And if that's causing you to struggle that way, you need to weigh that up. But any job is a fine place to serve God and we live in a time where the options are seemingly endless. Maybe for some of you, they don't feel that way, but we have so many more options than the Colossians had. I'm sure there's a fair chunk of that church that was slaves, and the others didn't really have many options either. And yet, no matter what you do, whatever you do, work at it hardly as for the Lord. You are serving the Lord Christ. He is your boss. So do it hardly because he's worth the honor. What job are you going to take? Take any job that allows you to live out your best response to Jesus' miraculous work for you. And we can use wisdom. We can ask others for wisdom. Approach people that you trust, that you know are going to say the truth in love to you. And say, this job, this thing I'm going for, do you think that's going to help me with my life calling to serve and honor Jesus? Or what do you see in me that I might be able to use to serve and honor Jesus? Use the wisdom of others. Ask them to tell you what you're good at, and what, what might be a good fit for you, but also ask them to lovingly point out your weaknesses. Another thing you can do when you're considering your job, your career, anything like that, is pray. But pray that God will use you wherever you work. Colossians 4, just after that, tells us to ask God for opportunities to talk about Jesus wherever we are. Pray about that so that whatever job you're stuck in, you are going to be fulfilling God's call on your life. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thank God for the blessing of your job. Thank God for the blessing of everything that he's done for you and that he's put you in this place where you can serve him. And that might just transform your whole thinking about your job. Ask him to show you how to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Getting back to chapter one there. In the job that you have, God, let me be filled with the knowledge of your will so as to walk in a manner worthy of you here in this place. How can I be fully pleasing to you here? How can I bear fruit for you right here? Here's one more thing that might help to steer you into 
meaningful work is just do stuff. I want to speak to those of you who are young and free of a lot of commitments. You've got a lot of spare time. You've got a lot of spare time. You're disagreeing with me, but you're wrong. (laughs) Use your time wisely. Do stuff. And that way you'll experience things, you'll develop skills, you'll, you'll learn new things, you'll understand how to do different jobs, you'll meet more people that you can minister to, you'll see more opportunities out there, and you'll have so many different ways that you can honor God. Use your time to do stuff. When I look at the work I do now as, as a pastor here in the church and a chaplain in the school, I'm so grateful for the weeks and weekends and holidays are dedicated to doing um, youth camps with Scripture Union and beach missions. I learned so many things there that I put into practice now and that shaped where I am now. I'm so grateful for the years that I spent working in factories and gaining an understanding for a whole section of the community that I never would have met. I'm grateful for all my experiences on the road with a band. Maybe don't do that one, but God can redeem stuff. But that develops skills and creativity and this sense of the importance of commitment and getting out there and meeting people and developing relationships. I'm even grateful for the mundaneness and discipline of working at McDonald's, for what it taught me about putting others first through service. Do stuff. I wasted a whole bunch of time as well, and I regret that. But do stuff. You've got so much time now. As soon as your first kid comes along, it'll be a shock. But you've got time now. Sell the Xbox. Redeem your time. Use all of it. God has called you to something great. Make the most of every moment he's given you. It's a gift and work, and work wholeheartedly, anywhere, and see where it leads you. And as you do that, God is going to equip you, and he's going to transform you, and who knows, he may work all of those things together for good. Sounds like a promise. Make the most of the time. God has called you to something great, and as you think about your work and what you do, let that dictate it. Marriage, your life calling in marriage. So if your life's calling is to know Jesus and fruitfully serve him in everything, well, how does that help you to think about who to marry? First up, it's worth noting that Paul suggests quite strongly in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that it's, it's a lot easier to stay single and that you can actually get a whole lot of ministry done as a single person that you just couldn't do if you were married. The singleness is a great thing with God's stamp of approval. It's a place you can freely and effectively fulfill God's calling on your life. Amen? Amen Amen to being single. But for those who are contemplating marriage anyway, here are some things to consider. Who should you marry? I guess one of the things that, that played on my mind and I'm sure it plays on a lot of minds, is that idea of how will I know that they are the one? That, that that person is the one, God's best for me. How can I figure out who that is? Because I don't want to miss that. And is there a danger of missing out on the one? Hopefully you've got a bit of an idea of how to answer that because you've been listening through the whole series, but This is pretty awesome. I read this this week and it it struck me as really simple and clear that we worry about finding the one. We even tell ourselves, well, I've just got to be the one and that will make it better. And there is wisdom in that. But check this out. This is Genesis chapter two. It's page two of the Bible. It's easy to find. Verse 24. This is after God made the man and the woman brought them together. 
Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Man and the woman, two people come together and become the one. That is the sacred, that is the holy, that is the one that you're searching for, is the two people committed to each other for life together. So anyone you marry is part of the new one. But you marry them and you commit to them for life and that's when they become the one. And that's a liberating thing. Do you get that? It's not about who you are. It's not about who the other person is. But as you come together, joined by God, that together is the one and it's something to be protected and cherished when it happens. But up until that point, it's wide open. So can you marry just anyone? Well, not quite. The Bible has a lot of wisdom on that as well. I'm just going to go through some stuff really quickly. And when I was at uni, um, the staff worker for the Christian student group that I was part of, uh, he spoke about fence posts. He said that women are like horses um, and that you need to choose the right horse And the way you choose the right horse is like, imagine the world is just this wide open field, but the right horses are all fenced in, into this one area. And he talked about these fence posts. Here are the fence posts. And these are all out of the Bible. Are they Christian? That's a really important one. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 6 both talk about that, the importance of being married to someone who is a believer. Because think about your life calling. What Jesus has called you to is to follow after him and devote the whole rest of your life to live as Christ, to die as gain. If I live, I live for the Lord. How is it going to be if I'm united to someone else who is not doing that? It's going to kill me. It's going to be really hard. What's it going to do to them? If you have the choice now before you're married, pick a believer for your sake, for their sake. That's the first fence post. Are they the opposite sex? The Bible's pretty clear on that as well. Jesus quotes that verse we looked at just before. Are they unmarried? Sounds pretty obvious, but these are the simple fence posts, and are they willing? Because it could be that they're just keen to live a single life for God. If they're not willing to get married to you, well, they're outside the fence. Anyway, so there's the horses inside the fence post. You got it? It's nice and simple. And you pick a horse and go for it. (laughs) It's pretty basic stuff, but it's a good start. The Bible also gives some some good advice on what to look for in a marriage partner and the character traits that can help or harm in marriage. And I'm really skimming over this, and we probably need a whole series on this, but just throwing some stuff out there. Learn from the lives of those in the Old Testament. There's a whole lot of marriages in the Old Testament, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're horrific. Read it and learn from it. Read through the Proverbs. The Proverbs talks a lot about people that are of worth associating with or, you know, don't have anything to do with the fool or a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. <laughs> Proverbs twenty-seven fifteen. And then I was trying to balance that one up with something about annoying husbands and I couldn't find anything. <laughs> but then I realised that most of the Proverbs is about lazy, foolish men (laughs) and how to avoid them. But Proverbs has a lot. And here's a really helpful passage right at the end of Proverbs, Proverbs 31. Take some time to sit down this week and read through Proverbs 31, 10 to 31. And then ask yourself this question. I don't know if you've looked at Proverbs 31 before, but it talks about the qualities of the ideal wife. 
an excellent wife who can find. She's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. And then it goes on and on and on for 21 verses about the things that she does. And she's amazing. Take this, read this, and then say to God, if this is what the ideal wife is like, then God, what am I going to do as a man to get to the point of deserving a woman like that? This is for you guys to read and do something about. If you want a woman of that standard, ah, maybe meet that standard. The Bible has a lot to say about the kind of person you should marry. And ask for wisdom. Again, listen to the people around you who can, you can trust them to tell the truth to you and you're willing to listen to them. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of the enemy. Is this person a good match for me? Talk to your family about that. Talk to your closest friends and be willing to really listen. I wish I'd really listened, Johnny. He had some good things to say and I didn't listen. But then I made the right decision later. In my dating years, I wish I'd spent more time asking that question and listening. And then pray. But don't just pray for God to send you a spouse. Pray that God will shape you to be the kind of person who could spouse well. If you're being conformed to the image of of God's Son, that's Romans 8. And if you're willing to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, you will be highly Highly spousable. That's a word. (laughs) You want to be the kind of person who can urge your spouse to live out God's calling on their life. You want to be that kind of person. You want to pray that God would transform you into that kind of person. Young men, pray through Proverbs 31 and ask God to make you into a man worthy of such a woman. And there's probably even some stuff in that chapter for the girls too. And then make a decision, but do it wisely. And ask yourself this question, is this a person I can gleefully join hands with in living out the best response that I can to Jesus' miraculous love for me? Is this a person I can gleefully join hands with and help them to live out the best response that they can to Jesus' miraculous love for them? Will this person help me to live out God's calling on my life? Will this person help me to live out God's calling on my life? It's foundational. Will I be able to help this person live out God's calling on their life? Because he's called them to something wonderful. And I don't want to get in the way. But by God's grace, I won't. Christians, those of you who have committed your lives to Jesus, he has set you free. Think about what God has done for you, delivering from the domain of darkness and transferring you to the kingdom of his beloved son and saying, go, go and live your life for me now. You've been called to a grand life. A life rich with purpose and clarity and you don't need to fear that you're going to miss out on God's will for your life because it's wide open. And he says, you just seek me first and you don't have to worry because I will guide you. You don't know my specific will for your life, but you do know my revealed will and it's clear. This is your life's great calling. Live it out. Know Jesus And live fruitfully for Jesus. And know that you've got all the strength you need to do that. Thanks to the Holy Spirit. What a great comfort to remember. Now every morning. When you wake up. And think what is this day going to be? Every day. When you come into that really difficult pressing situation. And you're wondering, what am I meant to do here? Every moment that you interact with a difficult person, every moment that you interact with an easy person, how am I meant to deal with this? As you lie in bed at night after you've turned out the light, 
and you're thinking, what does my life amount to? What am I meant to do with it? You know what you've been called to do. May you be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all spiritual understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him and bearing fruit in every good work. And he will give you the strength for that and the endurance. This is your life calling. This is your destiny. And it's wonderful. And let it shape everything else. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for spelling out to us so clearly. First of all, how we can be saved from darkness. Because Jesus Christ has set us free as we put our trust in him. And as we submit to him as Lord. And as we let him take over and we're free now. We're free from sin and doubt and confusion and any wonder about what we should do with our lives, and we know what to do now. And Father, we know and we want to live our lives for you, and please give us the strength to do that. Give us a greater knowledge of your Son, so that we might walk in a manner worthy of the Lord tomorrow, tonight, this week, every moment of our lives, fully pleasing to Him. We want our life to a to account for something good and that is the best thing that we can get to the end of it and hear you say well done that was a pleasing life please give us the strength to endure please give us the wisdom to make the right decisions that would help us to live out that grand life's calling thank you that our destiny is in your hands we submit to you in Jesus name amen Just also.